thank you for being here today. I'm Brian Clark uh, from the Hudson Institute um, and uh, uh, Henry uh, Sokolsky uh, and David D and I have been working on this series of uh, events looking at different aspects of AUKUS and how AUKUS might be uh, expanded more broadly, uh, both in the kinds of capabilities it's pursuing as well as the countries that are involved. Um, and so this is the latest installment of that series, um, all of which are available on um, the MPEC website. The um, uh, today or tonight's discussion is going to focus on uh, shipbuilding, and uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about ship repair, but the shipbuilding, ship repair industrial base, and how um, other countries you know, might be brought into it. Um, and uh, with us tonight to support that discussion are um, uh, Jeb Nadiner, who's a uh, former Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for Industrial Base, um, who is uh, you know, going to be talking a little bit about the opportunity space here, as, um, uh, as well as um, uh, Louis Bergeron, who will be here as well to speak on that. So um, with that, um, David, uh, do, do we normally, we don't normally do introductions around, right? We just go straight into the discussion. If I uh, remember yeah, we, correctly, we, right? We can go straight into presentations. That's fine. Okay, uh, great. Well, um, so uh, with that, um, I can go ahead and kick it off because I think, you know, my talk's going to be a little bit broader and, you know, kind of more focused on the overall uh, picture that surrounds U.S. Navy shipbuilding, ship repair challenges. Um, so I'll, um, I'll do that. So, David, if you want to bring up my slides, can you do that? Yep, got those coming up. Super. And um, so if you call it there, so um, the uh, the reason that we thought it was worth talking about this is obviously, you know, we've got um, AUKUS, you know, in, in progress. And then recently the um, White House announced that they were looking at opportunities to expand um, AUKUS into Pillar 2. There's been some discussion about, you know, expanding some of the elements of AUKUS to other countries like Japan, um, you know, like uh, Korea, perhaps, uh, maybe France. Uh, we've explored some of those opportunities in um, other technology areas, such as space, uh, in previous uh, events along in this series. Um, tonight, we're going to talk about shipbuilding. And so I wanted to talk a little bit about the U.S. Maritime Industrial Base and uh, what some of the challenges are that, you know, maybe could be assisted uh, by countries like Japan and Korea, both of which have a very strong shipbuilding and ship repair industry, um, and uh, you know, could offer the U.S. Uh, extra capacity or um, you know, specialized capacity uh, that could uh, allow it to um, surge capacity in the fleet or to support the fleet that we already have. So if you go to the next slide, uh, David. Excellent. So the, the, the Navy uh, fleet is in the process of a very slow, in my my opinion, but an evolution just the same, uh, moving away from um, a fleet composed almost entirely of large you know, multi-mission multi -mission combatants designed for um, high-end warfare, um, but in a you know pretty human-centric way. So you know, aircraft carriers, destroyers, cruisers, um, submarines, et cetera, uh, all crewed by humans and uh, intended to operate in highly contested environments. Um, so what we're seeing, though, is the, the challenge posed by um, countries like China, but also countries like Russia and Iran and others um, are now de deploying anti-ship weapons uh, with range and precision um, and in the numbers that would actually hold that fleet at risk. Um, and reduce the uh, reduce their ability to to be successful in some of the you know scenarios the Navy's now analyzing. So they're middle of this this uh, transition from a fleet that um, is you know very focused on large uh, manned platforms to one that's got a larger component of unmanned ships and smaller ships. So this this is supposed to create a larger fleet overall, you know, a larger number of hulls in the water, um, but also provide uh, ways to uh, or options for um, platforms that are uh, more risk worthy uh, or, you know, ones that you'd be willing to put into combat and, and maybe lose um, in the event of them being attacked. So, you know, we're looking for the fleet to essentially rebalance from uh, a small number of big things to a larger number of small things. Um, 
and you can see on this chart the rebalancing is you know gonna you know it's gonna take a while and it's not gonna be uh, as dramatic as I think maybe uh, some of the Navy had originally envisioned. What this opens up though is opportunities for new players to come into the shipbuilding world because the Navy is now looking for expanding the number of platforms that are not big specialized aircraft carriers, submarines, and surface combatants, but are instead uh, unmanned surface vessels, unmanned undersea vessels, small surface vessels, small logistics and support vessels. So they're, they're broadening the range of what constitutes a naval ship. So this creates opportunities for other countries to maybe contribute to that uh, because they have shipbuilding industries that are designed around you know, building efficiently and at a low uh, or at a low cost, um, you know, these kind of um, non-military or at least non-combatant platforms. Are you, you know the next slide? Um, so the Navy's shipbuilding industrial base um, is very much concentrated uh, regionally, um, and it's also concentrated uh, in terms of the types of platforms it builds. You know, so the yeah, the U.S. Navy depends on um, shipbuilders for surface combatants in Pascagoula with Heinz and Ingalls and in um, Bath, Maine with Lad Fire Ironworks, which is part of General Dynamics. So two shipbuilders for surface combatants, um, for large surface combatants like destroyers, um, and then um, one uh, shipyard for small surface combatants, frigates, uh, which is up in Marinette, Wisconsin. Uh, that, that's uh, Marinette Shipbuilding, which is part of Fink and Terry, a division of it, or I'm sorry, a subsidiary of it. Um, and then um, for submarines, uh, Heinz and Ingalls in, in Newport News and um, General Dynamics Electric Boat up in Grot. Um, and then for auxiliary ships, they pretty much larger auxiliary ships like oilers and uh, cargo ships are built uh, exclusively by NASCO, um, which is part of General Dynamics out in San Diego. Um, and then you've got down on the Gulf Coast, a few shipyards that are building um, smaller uh, auxiliary vessels like um, salvage ships, towing ships. Um, Austell has now pivoted from building littoral combat ships to building those kinds of auxiliary ships for the Navy uh, using steel construction. There's other shipyards in the, in the Gulf Coast that build uh, small ships for the Navy as well as for the Coast Guard. Um, they very much live in a hand to mouth existence. So they're not, they're not, they don't have a robust backlog um, unlike uh, the specialized military shipbuilders that build submarines, surface combatants, or aircraft carriers, um, or even the large auxiliary ships, all of which have a pretty strong you know, back order book because they've specialized and they kind of ship the Navy needs. But what this means, though, is that the Navy doesn't have much surge capacity in most classes of ships because all these shipyards that build submarines, surface combatants, carriers, um, and large auxiliary ships have right size themselves to meet the Navy's needs. They've specialized in the kind of platform that the Navy wants, and you know they've got a symbiotic relationship with the Navy. So if the Navy wants more of something, though, there is no new shipyard to go to, and that the Navy is finding out the challenges of that when it comes to submarine construction, for example, which is maxed out and can't be expanded because the two shipyards that build them um, are not able to, to grow uh, anymore. If you go to the next slide, um, David, the um, uh, if you look at the um, ship Ship where, the, where the ships are going. So the Navy is evolving its posture to, to focus more on the Pacific. This is part of the Pacific pivot, Pacific rebalance that started during the Obama administration. Um, so 60% of the fleet will soon be based in the Pacific, either on the west coast of the US or in Hawaii or in Guam or in Japan. Um, and uh, this creates a demand signal for ship repair. Um, and uh, also creates you know, maybe an opportunity for ship construction if you don't wanna have to move ships through the Panama Canal from the East Coast over to the West Coast, because that's where most of them are based. More ship construction on the West Coast would be beneficial, but as you saw from the previous chart, the only shipyard we have on the West Coast that builds, um, you know, a significant number of Navy ships is NASCO in San Diego, and they build auxiliary ships. If you want to build combatants, they're all coming from the East Coast uh, or the Gulf Coast. Um, so opportunities to do construction in the Pacific might be really good if you're trying to um, have a capacity you can tap into in wartime. You know, when building something on the East Coast and moving it to the West Coast is, you know, maybe not a, you know, acceptable delay or going through the canal may not be a great option if, uh, for example, China controls the Panama Canal uh, by virtue of its ownership of shipping or uh, ship operations company down there. Um, so Pacific construction might be really important. Next slide. 
Um, and so the Navy posture at sea is also reflective of this change. You're seeing this kind of shows a notional laydown of where ships are generally um, at this point. Um, and you're seeing, um, you know, with the, with the war in Russia or with the Russia's war in Ukraine, some of those forces that had previously been hanging around in the Indian Ocean or the Persian Gulf are now spending more of their time in the European theater. Um, but aside from that, you've still got this massive footprint in the Western Pacific. Um, and again, this creates a demand for ship repair um, that uh, the Navy doesn't, you know, generally only meets, only addresses this um, in the Pacific with voyage repair. So a ship breaks down, um, you may be, you're allowed to send it to a, a port in the Pacific into a country that's not the U.S. to get repaired. Um, and then you, if it's going to do a larger maintenance period, it has to go home to do that. Um, but there's options, obviously, in the Western Pacific to do more aggressive or more substantial repairs if the Navy were to take advantage of that. Um, legislation currently prohibits some, like a, essentially an overhaul style repair job, but you can get, you could probably do more than what the current Navy currently does within the, um, within the law. Um, all right, next slide. Um, and then the Navy ship repair capacity. So this this map shows where ship repair yards are. Um, it seems like a lot. It seems like there's a lot of ship repair yards in the U.S. We should be in great shape when it comes to ship repair. Um, the problem is though that all of these yards are um, living hand to mouth. You know, so they they are they compete for every ship repair job that comes up is competed individually by the Navy, um, and therefore each of these um, shipyards is you know, living in a sort of hand to mouth existence where you can't really plan ahead that far because you're not absolutely sure what you might have in terms of workload a year from now um, or two years from now. So they're not putting investment in their capacity. They're not investing in workforce. They're not looking to build spare capacity in anticipation of future jobs. Um, they really don't, they're right sizing themselves for the demand signal. The Navy is finding out the, back, the bad parts of that today because a lot of ship, uh, a lot of uh, destroyer, cruiser and amphibious ship maintenance periods are running long. There's no insufficient capacity to accommodate them um, and then things back up. So they're having ships that are very late going into their maintenance periods um, and or coming out late. Uh, and so the fleet's suffering and you're seeing this in discussions about uh, like the uh, General Berger brings up about amphibious ships to say, you know, a third of our amphibious ships are down hard. Why is that? Well, it's because there's insufficient ship repair capacity in the US because all these companies are right sized. Um, that's partly a function of the way the Navy contracts ship repair, um, but it's also just a function of, you know, there's, this is a completely privately funded enterprise. Um, and unlike the ship construction industrial base, where you can sort of depend on a steady demand signal from the Navy, because you know what the shipbuilding plan looks like for the next at least five years, if not 30 years. Um, on the ship repair side, they've got plans and it's, it's, you're still competing though against other yards and you're not sure what your workload's likely to be. So if you go to the next slide to kind of it sort of clarify some of that. So it, the other part of this is the ship dry dock situation. Um, this is improving, but still not great. You know, the ship dry dock, ship dry docks are, are, are predominantly on the east coast of the U.S. because that's where the Navy used to be. Um, so most of these dry docks were built back in the Cold War. Um, and that's when we had most of our forces on the east coast to deal with Russia. That's, of course, changing with the pivot to Asia and 60 percent of our fleet being in the west coast. More ship more dry docks are being built and uh, established or reestablished on the West Coast, but still we're short of dry dock capacity, which is another factor in slowing down ship repair uh, work. Again, there's an opportunity here to take advantage of dry docks in the Western Pacific to do some of the work that we would, you know, otherwise be waiting in line to do uh, in the United States. Uh, next slide. And then when it comes, like I said, you know, the, the ship repair work is planned out in advance. So just like you know the, the, the shipbuilding plan, you can kind of see what the demand signal is likely to be. But whereas the shipbuilding plan or in shipbuilding, we have a highly specialized yards. So when the shipbuilding plan says we're gonna build two destroyers every year going for the next 20 years plus, um, that means Bath Ironworks and Huntington Ingalls can both depend on at least, you know, usually a ship per year coming out of that. Um, here, the, you can see the repair work is um, organized by region. Um, and uh, it's unclear, you know, there's multiple ship repair yards in each region. So you're competing against each other to get those jobs. And, you know, the workload may be fair shared essentially between them, but it's hard to tell from month to month, you know, what it's going to look like. 
Um, and you know, you can't plan out a workforce if you're not sure what your ship repair um, opportunities are going to be. This leads to a real um, reticence to invest, and that's why the capacity is is less than what's necessary because none of the companies bother to invest in future uh, work. Um, but again, that means there's opportunities to take advantage of overseas capacity in ship repair. Uh, and I think that's it. If I go to the next slide. Yep, that's it. So, um, so I just just with that sort of intro, there's there's a clearly an opportunity, a demand signal here from um, overseas ship repair, shipbuilding that could be met um, with uh, partners like Japan and Korea, which have a strong shipbuilding industry and a strong tradition of very efficient shipbuilding. Um, so I'll stop there, and I'm going to turn it over to Jeb uh, Nadner. Um, and we can go further into some of these opportunities and talk about what those might consist of. And Lewis obviously will join in this discussion as well. So, um, David, back to you. And then, um, Jeb, uh, please take it from here. Thank you, Brian. Uh, thank you, uh, NPEC and uh, Hudson. Uh, always great partners. Um, I'm Jeb Nadoner, uh, Senior Vice President at Govini. Um, we've got a, a a commercial data platform where we work on uh, supply chains. We've got digital twins of the US allied and industrial bases. Um, so just to give you uh, the things, things in short, um, our Navy isn't short on 21st century uh, Halseys, but it is short on ships. Um, Navy keeps getting smaller. It hasn't reached mandated fleet size. We're decommissioning and waiting for future ships. Um, almost every facet, construction, maintenance, modernization, face delays. Um, and the wider American maritime industrial base, beyond the Navy even, has been getting smaller, not even since the 1980s, but even at least a decade or two earlier. Um, so that means the condition of many of our shipyards and berths and dry docks uh, are not, not able to keep up with what the stakeholders want. And those stakeholders are the Navy, there are other crucial federal maritime players. They are uh, companies, uh, large and small, um, all of whom would like to get into best of class international shipbuilding. Um, and if you have less throughput, then you're often your engineering uh, suffers as well too. So in short, uh, the Navy and the wider ecosystem have not seen the resources and conditions, I believe, requisite for maintaining uh, U.S. Sea, sea power by a decisive margin. Uh, now, some of our allies have great uh, shipbuilding capabilities, Japan and Korea, but I'd also even mention Italy, uh, very impressive capabilities I've seen. Um, and the Asians in particular operate with a throughput that's hard to imagine here. Now, the reasons are many why the size of our US built fleets are too small and why the shipbuilding industrial base is not uh, what it'd like to be. Um, yet in any event, with the rise of the PRC, uh, the risks have grown too quick for us to continue to accept the status quo. Um, and if there's a conflict, uh, what if we lose, heaven forbid, uh, a lot of ships? Uh, how are we going to replace them? How long will it take to fix those that survive? If we run short on warships, then we're going to be short on fires. Uh, if we run out of support ships, uh, our surviving warships um, are not going to have sea legs. If it takes 10 or 12 years to reconstitute a fleet, um, the war is going to be over uh, unless we're ready to pursue um, the 21st century's 30-year war. And all of this is now lost on the PRC, and this affects our deterrence. Um, so what I propose is we need to close the book on the last 30 years uh, and open a new one. And we've got to take some bold action. And that action has got to be in the mode of FDR and Reagan, uh, Knox and Lehman, Stark and Hayward. And that means action to rejuvenate and expand the entire U.S. national security shipbuilding enterprise. And to do so, that's going to require a large expansion of resources. There's no way around it. Uh, more flow will make a lot of things go better. Um, to get more resources, we need to have a political deal that makes that feasible. 
And we've got to have a third part of that is we've got to have expanded cooperation with allied companies. So what I'm proposing is uh, the Naval Deterrence Act, and they would state to the effect that in light of the Chinese Navy surpassing the size of the U.S. fleet, Congress authorizes the issuance of a five-year federally backed $100 billion U.S. deterrence bond. This would be similar to the Liberty Bond that enabled in 1940 the implementation of the Two Ocean Navy Act. And along with that uh, $100 billion deterrence bond, there'd be the issuance of federal tax incentives to catalyze and offset some of the capital costs that are going to be required by the private sector, and also loan guarantees to facilitate the capital markets. Now, all of this is with the objective, and it would state in law, of getting to 350 vessels manned and unmanned, and also a wider national security maritime fleet, which is uh, includes the Navy, but it's beyond the Navy. And this is crucial. The eligibility for the funds, the tax incentives, the loan guarantees would be for U.S. and allied shipbuilders on the condition that they expand capability and production in the U.S. Uh, one aim would be to incentivize allies to bring the best of their shipbuilding and integration technologies, their engineering, the infrastructure to the U.S. Let them bring modular cutting edge shipyards. Um, let us encourage U.S. and allied company partnerships and joint ventures. Um, and let's bring in some of the industrial, you know, era 4.0 and supply chain approaches. The analogy here is the CHIPS Act. In the CHIPS Act, one of the things we're doing is we're saying there are some areas where allies are ahead. And uh, we're just simply not going to outsource everything to them. Rather, we're going to incentivize them to come here and employ Americans. Um, who would be the winners of a Naval Deterrence Act? Well, the U.S. Navy, but also the Coast Guard, NOAA, Merid, Jobs, um, especially some of the well-known shipbuilding states and nationwide suppliers. So think of Maine, Connecticut, Mississippi, Wisconsin, state of Washington, California, Virginia, Alabama, Louisiana, Florida, sort of the heart of um, those with uh, the greatest naval interest in the Congress, but also but there'd be others. Uh, I think there'd be room here to expand uh, facilities more in land that can make ship components and subcomponents. Um, so we would modernize the existing ship enterprise in the states and expand to others. I believe that all of these winners would form a winning po winning coalition. So sort of similar to what we saw in the Chips Act. This would be the winning coalition to pass the act, build more ships, and ultimately keep command of the seas. So we need winning political coalitions. Uh, we can't just have reasonable, great ideas that have no political future. So I believe what's at stake in this early part of the century uh, and really maintaining our deterrence is uh, building up that uh, national security, maritime industrial base. So with that, and I'll be writing this up soon with uh, my colleague, Louis, I'm now handing this off to Louis Bergenon, um, who's going to continue with this, uh, new construct. Thanks, Jeb. And, and 1 of the things that, um, and thanks again to impact and, uh, and Hudson for this opportunity. Um, so I'll share a couple of slides, uh, some of which uh, Brian Clark went over so expertly, um, and so I'll I'll kind of uh, modulate some of the product uh, of the uh, uh, of the conversation. Uh, but one of the, you know part of this is when you're thinking about how to bring in allies and partners, especially uh, uh, Japan and South Korea, uh, is to kind of understand the state of the of the current laydown of shipbuilding and repair. And as Brian so so uh, eloquently talked about. It's the repair part that may be the most salient uh, for bringing allies and partners into the uh, into the equation, both overseas and maybe even uh, uh, supporting some of the uh, um, United States locations, U.S. based locations. So you look at this current map, uh, is, as Brian was mentioning, uh, there is a, a preponderance of the shipbuilding capability on the East Coast and the Atlantic base and uh, base uh, parts. 
Uh, you also see the two nuclear uh, facilities that were brought in Connecticut and Newport News that pr provide um, the nuclear Navy side of the Navy, so both the submarines and the uh, aircraft carriers. Um, so what we'll be kind of talking about here is about expanding the non-nuclear side of that of the Navy uh, in some of the key, key areas um, outside of uh, the Atlantic um, uh, side. Um, well, another thing to note is, uh, as Brian also mentioned in, in, um, in what we're, we're talking about here, is that the, the difference between the kind of seven major shipyards uh, that, that we discussed earlier uh, in, the, in the orange here, the kind of regional ones that are uh, doing the, the more uh, hand to mouth as Brian was talking about, but also some expansive uh, uh, areas where they're uh, building new, uh, new classes of, uh, of ships, both uh, for the Coast Guard uh, and for uh, for Marad, actually, um, but also looking at the the private the the sorry the public shipyards. Well, one of the things that gets confusing uh, in the public debate is that difference between the public shipyards and the private uh, shipyards, and the ones that actually construct things versus the ones that repair things. And one of the things to note about those public shipyards is that uh, there are some initiatives that are going on. So the ship uh, shipyard. Uh, infrastructure optimization program that is uh, uh, currently uh, getting off off uh, to a, a to a start um, is is designed to uh, to input or sorry improve the uh, capacity and capability of those public shipyards. But those public shipyards are largely focused on the nuclear side of of the uh, of the U.S. Navy fleet. Occasionally, they'll do work on um, on, on uh, surface ships. Uh, on the non-nuclear side, but for, for the most part, they are tied up with work on our submarines and our aircraft carriers. And again, as, as noted before, uh, the, the two, two are on the East Coast. Uh, there is one in Hawaii and one in Bremerton uh, or Puget Sound, and those are your four uh, public shipyards. There used to be more, <laughs> now they're not. Uh, there used to be a, a lot more uh, shipbuilding as well uh, in the Pacific Northwest, as well as in, in, uh, in California. Uh, that has uh, since been consolidated and probably doing minor work, but not the, uh, the extent that they used to. So just a, a, the, another, another look at the laydown of the U.S.-based um, shipbuilding uh, production and repair capacity. And one of the other things to kind of talk about when we're talking about, um, uh, you know, bulking up the U.S. fleet is kind of the, the uh, genesis of this thing for with allies with ally support. One is to think about, okay, what is capacity and what is, um, what are you really trying to get after? You're really trying to get after operational availability. And to do that, to build that capacity and build that operational availability for a, a time of conflict is kind of the, the main thing that you're trying to do. You do that in two ways. One is increasing shipbuilding production, which uh, the, um, is, has been going on for the last uh, few years, both on the submarine side, the nuclear side, as well as on the non-nuclear side. Uh, there's a lot of contracts being let. There was an increase to three destroyers and FY23 in the budget. So there is kind of an increase in production uh, for the shipbuilding side. Uh, in, in kind of a symbiotic relationship with that, there's also um, need to optimize the ship sustainment repair and modernization pieces as well. They interplay together in a lot of different ways, uh, shipyards, suppliers, and the broader uh, ecosystem supports both those things. Uh, you know, but your allies are probably going to be doing more of the uh, the latter, so helping out with the ship repair uh, and uh, sustainment piece rather than the shipbuilding production piece, um, uh, just in, uh, on, on an overseas uh, area. And the other two areas to kind of uh, also break down when we're talking about capacity and bulking up the U.S. fleet is thinking about the two areas where where um, uh, Navy spends a lot of time and, and money is looking at uh, government furnished equipment and gov and contractor furnished equipment. And the way to kind of think about those is the government furnished equipment are things like combat systems, uh, weapons. Uh, all those things. And so, you know, some of the articles that have come out recently about, you know, successes for uh, Japanese and South Korean uh, shipbuilders, uh, largely a lot of the systems that go on those uh, in terms of the weapon systems and the combat systems are actually supplied by uh, United States companies uh, through FMS, which is um, um, uh, foreign military sales, as well as direct um, commercial sales uh, of equipment like a Mark 41 launchers and Seawiz and Aegis. Uh, so a lot of that uh, uh, of uh, 
uh, success that they've had is through uh, purchasing U.S. Uh, government furnished equipment that we would we typically categorize as government furnished equipment. So that production statement will, will largely remain U.S. based. There is an opportunity, however, expanding the supplier capacity in those relevant uh, GFE sectors. So uh, all the different, uh, 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 if you're making radars or um, uh, launchers. Uh, there could be suppliers that uh, need help and could use investment from uh, from allied countries to uh, to help increase the capacity uh, on the contractor furnished equipment. That's really diving into uh, engines, auxiliary systems, um, uh, pumps, uh, motors, all those things that are uh, that are, are provided by the shipyards themselves. And data can really help uh, be used to identify the shortfalls in that contractor furnished equipment supplier base so looking at the at the uh the suppliers down to the uh the lower tiers of the supply base to look at that that health and then start thinking about the the areas where you would want investment so if you're seeing ca capacity shortfalls in a particular market whether it's castings or forgings or semiconductors or waveguards whatever it is you can start to think about in encouraging investment in those areas from select allied uh, uh, countries like a like a japan or south korea or some of your other uh, friends like the uk um, and uh, in, in Australia, for instance, uh, you know, this happens quite a bit. There are uh, foreign suppliers currently in our uh, supply chain supplying both contractor furnished equipment and government furnished equipment or pieces and parts thereof. Um, and that's where where you can start to see some of those uh, some of those gains and start thinking about uh, exploring some shipyard capacity investments in the U.S. as well. And this is something that's also been done uh, in the past. We'll talk about a little bit later about the, uh, uh, think, uh, the Italians in, uh, in Wisconsin, uh, the Australians at Austell in Alabama, as well as uh, Norwegians in Philadelphia for the Philly shipyard for uh, um, uh, the construction of, of Marad. Um, and again, kind of, if you're thinking about how do I actually bulk up capacity, I'm probably going to be thinking from Allied. I'm going to be thinking about that uh, sustainment repair and modernization for actual work on ships. But there is the broader industrial base, a uh, supplier base investment that could uh, support capacity gains. And finally, if you're looking at that non-nuclear um, shipbuilding ecosystem, it's helpful to kind of think about what's in production and what's in sustainment. And how do you think about uh, uh, gaining more capacity in those different areas? And so what we've done is basically broken down the combatants, the support and auxiliary uh, ships, as I talked about earlier, as well as the Coast Guard, unmanned, and other maritime um, systems. As Jeb was talking about, <clears throat> all these interplay together. They, they work in the same ecosystems largely. They share a lot of the same suppliers. Uh, the repair and the production sides uh, kind of happen uh, in in some but somewhat of a uh, collaborative and eco and uh, symbiotic relationship, um, but thinking about areas where allies can actually help out is uh, is an interesting one. So it, it, obviously on on some of these I put some flags of where Australian, where Italian companies are helping out as well as Norwegian companies. So this isn't new, uh, but could be a way to to entice uh, as as Jeb was talking about enticing uh, countries to come bring. Uh, new new uh, production methods, new cap capabilities to uh, either old shipyards or our current shipyards to really help uh, with that capacity throughput uh, on both the uh, GFE and the CFE equipment. Uh, one of the other areas that you're just thinking about is uh, you're probably not going to outsource production of combatants, but there could be areas where uh, given the conditions of geopolitically, you may look for uh, support at, at maybe even furnishing some of the core uh, uh, CFE, the contractor furnished equipment, as well as uh, maybe even the holes of things like the LSM, the uh, the, the uh, light amphibious warship. If you're if you're looking at a production rate of 18 to 35, and you're you're very concerned about uh, war, are there ways to start to off uh, offshore some of those things or bring uh, foreign companies onto the US uh, to, to use US based um, uh, uh, facilities to to produce those uh, in, in a more mass production uh, area. So uh, looking across these different uh, support ships, as well as some of these unmanned uh, ones, there could be opportunities to invite um, uh, foreign uh, allied countries to, to a bid on those and maybe even start production uh, stateside 
or even offshore some of that uh, for, uh, for, for production speed. Uh, the other areas to note is just on that sea lift side. And as Jeb was talking about, uh, the logistics are going to kind of be the, the key to everything, logistics and repair. Uh, you're probably not going to be, uh, depending on how, how a war starts and, and ends, uh, you, you may not get to the place of, of uh, cranking out more uh, combatants to fill gaps. You're probably going to be repairing them and making sure that they're sustained forward. So the sea lift piece, the auxiliary piece, the logistics piece, even the tenders. So the, the new tender for the submarine will be coming out. Uh, World War II, we use destroyer tenders and throughout the Cold War as well. You know, those could be areas where you're thinking about getting uh, repair uh, facilities out into the Pacific theater, which is much, uh, which, which uh, you know, thinking about um, response time there and uh, in geopolitical sensitivities, you may want to actually have more tenders and uh, and auxiliary ships and logistics ships to support uh, operations overseas. So thinking about those areas and exploring those around how allies could support either through uh, su uh, support in the supplier base or through production means and repair. So, uh, kind of uh, summing up, uh, operational availability needs to be supported by this capacity growth in both shipbuilding production and repair on both the CFE and GFE sides to, uh, to handle that increased demand of, and prepare for a a possible conflict and contingencies. And that real, the supplier and market data can really help inform where investment by allies and partners in the ship, shipbuilding industrial base could support increased U.S. production and sustainment capacity. And then thinking about that ship sustainment and repair overseas with targeted investment by uh, in, in U.S. space capacity could prove useful in peacetime and critical during conflict to have more flexibility in the ship sustainment and repair uh, uh, capacity and, and throughput. And finally, just thinking about select options for allied overseas productions uh, could be uh, could be explored primarily in the sea lift and auxiliary support craft and vessels but even in supporting unmanned platforms. So if you need to uh, have the holes of unmanned platforms, but not all the, the, uh, the government furnished equipment, uh, that could be a, a way to cheaply uh, and efficiently and, and quickly uh, produce some of those uh, uh, whole forms overseas and uh, ship them to the United States for, for integration on combat systems and weapon systems. So with that, I'll, I'll pause. Uh, great. Uh, thank so uh, thank you very much, uh, Louis. That was terrific. Um, you know, and clearly there's opportunities here uh, for uh, foreign countries to come help. I mean, as hostile as and, and bigotry of both uh, coming to the United States and established U.S. subsidiaries. Um, but there's probably and then as you said, there's opportunities to expand that uh, further uh, if the demand signals there. So I want to open it up for uh, questions uh, from the group. So. It's harder for me to see, David. So, uh, are, are, uh, does anybody have their hands up to um, bring up a question? I don't see any raised hands at the moment. But if anyone does have uh, questions, uh, feel free to, to either put your hand up or put a note in the chat uh, that we can uh, refer to. I, I see, I see a raised hand. Uh, oh, okay. PEO ships. Yeah, greetings, Tom Anderson here. Appreciate the uh, the opportunity to get together and talk and and the presentations. Um, uh, I do, I do really um, kind of get excited over this discussion of a Naval Deterrence Act, and um, you know some of the things that would would uh, energize the shipbuilding industrial base. Um, as I as I as I think about that, the discussion seemed largely focused on. Um, on U.S. Navy and um, and uh, you know ships in, to aid us in our uh, in our uh, in our Navy. Have you given thoughts to the implications or how to bring commercial uh, work into um, play in this act? One one of the things I would share with you is that you know that you all are better um, educated this than me. You know, we had we had the world advantage coming out of World War II with naval facilities to build ships, and we let it atrophy, and uh, you know, never really instituted any kind of robust commercial shipbuilding industry to leverage in this country. So, as you're talking about the language associated with this Naval Deterrence Act, does it in any way float all boats with regards to commercial shipbuilding? 
think I've put out a um, a Christmas tree, a skeletal, um, a skeleton that things on which could be hung well. Uh, but I, I can tell you my, my own experience, uh, what I've seen out of Italy in terms of commercial shipbuilding, three years to produce. They can tell you by they can tell you by the week of delivery from the time you order. Three years to produce one of those marvelous cruise ships. I mean, they're really feats of engineering. Um, not battle worthy. Um, some of them may make great decoys. We may need to employ if you come to extremis, but uh, there is a lot to learn there, I believe. So that's one of the reasons why I mentioned them. But I think this is the kind of idea that um, I plan on, uh, Louie and I plan on doing a paper on uh, this subject. Um, and we're going to welcome uh, feedback. And this is something we're going to, you know, circulate uh, because it's, it's time to shake things up. Uh, the debate has been, the discussion of the last 30 years has been, in some ways, um, I feel it's repetitive and stagnant. Um, right. So. And so uh, one thing I would add, Tom, thank you very much for coming uh, tonight. Uh, one thing I'll add is, um, you know, building, rebuilding U.S. commercial shipbuilding capacity is going to require um, efforts to, you know, essentially to require U.S. built hulls, you know, like, like the Jones Act. Um, and so one thing we're pursuing at Hudson uh, with Mike Roberts, who just left Crowley, is um, you're trying to expand the U.S. flag fleet. So what are some mechanisms to do that? And then can we go beyond that to not just require U.S. flag fleet to be grown, but also to require that to be increasingly U.S. built? So we're looking at um, mechanisms to make that happen. But uh, it seems like you know that's going to be what's required is to you know some forcing function that makes um, com shipping companies have to operate under their U.S. flag. So, um, other questions, David, are there other yeah, people uh, hands raised? So I, I saw another raised hand, but first, uh, I saw, uh, Zach Keck had a, a comment sort of on this topic. I don't know if, uh, Zach, if you wanted to step in with that. Yeah, just curious what everyone thought about the idea that some have proposed of like buying merchant ships as a way to search capacity quickly and putting canonized missiles on them. And. And all that is that a way to search capacity and perhaps buying them from shipyards, allied shipyards, <clears throat> or allied countries so they could be serviced um, in, you know, Japan and South Korea. So I'll I'll, I'll jump in first and then uh, and then I'd, I'd love to hear what Louis has to say. But I I'd say, um, in theory, yes. Uh, the difficulty though is, um, you know, we're more we're less like we're probably not going to have the missiles or the launchers <laughs> to put on them. Um, you know, so, I, you know, it seems like right now the munitions capacity is the limiting factor rather than the hulls to put the munitions on. Um, now, you could, and, the, and Henry would bring this up, uh, you could play a shell game where you say, well, we're going to do this, um, and maybe some of these launchers aren't fully, you know, filled out, and some are, um, but then if you're the opponent, you have to sort of guess uh, which one's which. Um, you know, but then you get into some difficulties of, well, who mans these ships? Um, is it the merchant marine? Are they going to be? Is that because they're currently not necessarily set up to man you know, warships? Do we put a U.S. detachment on it? So there's ways to work through that, but there's a lot of things that have to be worked through if you want to press civilian or commercial container ships into service as or you know uh, potential uh, warships. But you could it certainly could do it. I think you have to think about the munitions capacity as a limiting factor and think about what's the best way to exploit those hulls, even if you don't have. Um, necessarily a large number of munitions to put on them. Um, and I, I'd love to hear what Louis has to say. Yeah, Brian, I completely agree that the munitions piece has to happen first. Um, you have to have, well, 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 maybe in tandem, you have to have the munitions capabilities. I actually spent a lot of time, so I was a service warfare officer, I spent time on uh, DDGs and uh, uh, mine hunters. And then I got a really unique opportunity to be on a um, uh, USNS ship. So it was a float, a float, a float forward staging base, uh, Fred W. Stockham. 
It was uh, Gunnery Sergeant Fred W. Stockham. Uh, it was uh, overseas, and the capacity there was was huge. And it was a foreign uh, purchased ship, so it was built overseas, uh, and uh, and then bought by um, MSC and, and operated with a military detachment on it. The capacity of those ships, if you wanted to have a um, a missile merchant or something of the like. Uh, were, were phenomenal. I mean, the 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 size of almost an aircraft carrier, um, and you could think about magazine depth uh, in in a, in a lot of different ways. And one of the things that was was very interesting was just the stealth aspect of some of these different uh, 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 platforms. Now that is getting really asymmetric, uh, asymmetric. Uh, but I think when we get into um, you know the next couple of years. You know, thinking through how do you do containerized weapon systems? How do you leverage um, cheaper, lower cost uh, vessels, either purchased from overseas or you can build them here? Um, the MLP, the uh, extraditionary uh, sea base, could be some sort of a platform where you uh, provide that and it's built at NASCO and, and San Diego. So there's a lot of different ideas on it. I think they're they're all you know worthy of of some exploration. Uh, I think you know you do need some sort of uh, naval deterrence act to to probably galvanize the requirements and the resource sponsors at OpNav to, to give those serious uh, complica uh, uh, complementation or um, uh, consideration uh, to actually get the demand signal out to uh, to the fleet and to the uh, program executive offices to actually go out and explore these things, uh, you know, before before a, a war starts out. So how do how do you kind of think through, um, you know, using these that kind of expanded capability? And this will all underpin the what the uh, Navy has been working on, uh, which was the distributed maritime operations. How do you get to the afloat if if it floats it fights type of mentality? How do you uh, create uh, harder targeting equations for the adversary? And how do you get uh, a bit more asymmetric than we may have been um, than we probably have been doing most recently? Let me add. Um... I mean, something we need to think about as part of the Naval Deterrence Act is really expanding, for example, uh, mine capability. Mines that you can throw off a lot of different ships. Um, that really creates a lot of difficulties uh, for an adversary. So it's a little different way than we've tended to think about things. We've, we've thought about, you know, countries that throw mines off uh, commercial ships. Uh, they're the Libyans, Gaddafi. Um, we, we don't need to do that, but I think that given the, you know, the degree of challenge that we face in uh, the Pacific, uh, these are the things we need to think about. Um, so, and maybe it'll bring a number of new players, you know, into the mine business as well, too, because you have all these venture back co companies like our own that, um, you know, that are eager to participate in this market and support it. And do so cost effectively. Great, thank you. So for, for the next question, I see uh, Mark Rosenblatt has a hand up. Yeah, um, thank you. I, I, I want to just ask a question about if, if you look at the two years it took to pass the CHIPS Act, and then you think about your Naval Deterrence Act, let me ask the following question, and there's a follow up. If you knew for certain 100% that you would face either coercion or an active war over Taiwan in 2027, would be, this be the path you're taking for your well-developed thought through plan, or would you do something else? Well, uh, I'll, I'll start. I'm, I'm very interested in what Jeb and Louie have to say, but um, so I would say, uh, this is part of what you do. So the focus I would make is part of what the Naval Deterrence Act would do, which is to prioritize ship repair. So expanding ship repair capacity, bringing foreign players in to help expand our ship repair capacity, leveraging foreign ship repair capacity, because we have a lot of ships that are basically um, sitting um, uh, at the pier, unable to get repaired or overhauled, uh, either due to a lack of capacity or a lack of money to pay for their ship repair to the repair job. So we have a large, for example, we've got a half dozen cruisers in the US Navy that are commissioned vessels that do not operate or deploy because they're not being maintained. And the Navy is essentially uh, hanging onto them on the pier, um, waiting for them to be decommissioned. So 
uh, the money taking the, the if you wanted to do improve Navy capacity in the next five years, the way to do it is let's bring all of these ships that are in commission but not in service really um, you know, out of the yards, um, and that would be a substantial undertaking. But it's feasible and it's certainly executable with the additional uh, funds that you can get through a naval deterrence act. So, and, and there's capacity overseas that you could leverage in doing that. Um, so I'll pass it over to Louis and Jeff and see what they have to say. Yeah, agree, agreed on the repair piece. Again, it's you know it's kind of talked about. You get you get operational availability by two ways: building or repairing faster, so you get things uh, in and out of the shipyards quicker. Um, and uh, and so I think I think our our building side, uh, you know, could be supported, but that's going to take time. I think the repair side and making sure ships get through operational uh, uh, availabilities uh, and um, and repair periods quicker is going to increase your um, your your readiness levels within the fleet. Um, and again, though, you do need the supplier base that supports that as well as the shipyards itself. So getting parts, long lead time parts, uh, you know, administrative lead times on, on certain parts could be, uh, you know, uh, years. Uh, so making sure that you've got that plan and you're at also building your uh, supplier base in tandem with your uh, shipbuilding repair base. Um, in terms of facilities is going to be key to making sure that the Navy has the parts on hand uh, at the right time for to, to make sure that those repairs go smoothly and quickly, whether uh, uh, whether in the United States or overseas. Uh, Mark, uh, do I like the timeline? Not at all. Um, do I like what's happened to our Navy? Over the past 30 years, not at all. Uh, am I happy that the pivot to the Pacific started with President Obama? And, uh, you know, is inching forward since then? Not at all. Uh, but we are where we are. Uh, but I do know that come extremis, uh, will be no different than the Brits in World War II uh, when they faced, you know, some very serious naval surprises and they began to. They had to think quickly and mobilize in ways they didn't expect, including uh, creating flat tops, sometimes in weeks, and then putting a hawk or hurricane on top of them uh, to counter uh, German subs. So uh, I think we need more of that mentality now. Um, and uh, hopefully it doesn't come to that. Yeah, I, I just want to point out that if you're two years to passing a bill, you know, it's now the third year. They haven't put out a dollar of money yet. So, so you're nominally, you know, 2024, 5, 6. You're mid-26 right now before your plan, you know, sees a dollar, you know, deployed. Right. All right. And that's a great plan, but I think it's frankly useless. Well, I, I think the 2027 timeline is not necessarily accurate. So I don't think that's necessarily, I think you're, you're okay. putting it straight I'll, out. I'll that accept that. Sense. So let me ask um, you the uh, following question, Brian, then. Brian, if, if it's not a 20, if it's not 100% in 2027, what if you knew it was 50%? Would you, would you change something? What if you knew it was 25%? Would you right. change something? What, at what point do you act? Uh, yeah, so I think, you know, Jeb brings up a good point. I think I would focus on ship repair and then I'd focus on mobilizing the commercial base. So how can you mobilize uh, commercial capacity to support uh, increasing naval capacity? And that gets to, you know, Zach's point about, you know, do we bring commercial ships, you know, into naval service, you know, like we did in World War II, pressing them into naval service and making them, uh, you know, missile launchers or uh, making them, um, you know, ASW platforms or whatever. So I think, yeah, I definitely, if you, if you have, you know, pretty reasonable surety that is a 25% or more, then you're going to have, you change the character of this and really focus on bringing the hulls that you have up to full operational capability and then bringing new hulls into service that already exist. You wouldn't be necessarily focusing on sh new construction of, you know, high end warships. Um, and I, and I, but I think there's opportunities there, but you're right. You would change the, you change the framework of this, uh, of this bill, uh, you know, to focus on those two dimensions. 
Um, and I think there's opportunities in the commercial shipbuilding industrial base to leverage, you know, that, to get that capacity by basically taking those things and modularizing the payloads they carry and, and using them. Uh, and, and you have to you have to rebuild your con ops around that, which is something you do in a commercial context. So we rebuild our mission threads, our kill chains around the idea that we're going to use commercial platforms to carry payloads that are then going to be used in these naval operations. But it's certainly feasible. I do, but you're right. You change the the character of the bill. I agree. Okay, um, we. I get... Yeah, go unless, ahead. If Les had another note, sorry, I was just going to move on to the next question. If there's more discussion, uh, go ahead. Oh, oh go ahead. Okay, uh, the next hand raise I saw was from uh, Matthew May. Uh, hi, yes. Uh, thank you guys for the discussion. I just had a question about the workforce. Uh, one of the things you see a lot with the shipyards is a high workforce attrition rate. Um, do you guys have any thoughts about how that problem might be alleviated? Thank you. Uh, Louis and Jeff, what do you guys think? I, so, I'm not sure about the attrition. We, we've uh, focused a little bit and worked a little bit on understanding the, the kind of the labor demand and the supply and demand. So we've kind of modeled out some of those things for, um, uh, for, for Navy in the, in the Gulf Coast region. And 1 of the things you find is that, yes, the shipyards. Uh, do have an ability to attract talent. It's, uh, it's tough out there though. There's a lot of competing demands on the industrial base right now. Because you could go be a laborer at a shipyard, or you could go, um, you know, perhaps build a bridge because of the uh, infrastructure uh, bipartisan infrastructure act. There's the inflation reduction act, which adds more, um, you know, charging stations, windmills, solar panels. So there's a lot of options for people, and I think part of it is is uh, getting the demand side right and making sure that the shipyards uh, have that steady supply of, uh, of of kind of predictable demand. And I think that will help uh, with retention. Uh, I think the, probably the worst thing is, is kind of the fluctuations that happen uh, in contract cycles and in um, and just kind of uh, you know delays on a contract or something where you lose you lose the work and you probably lose the workers because there's probably other work that they could do, especially with the kind of juice demand that the uh, U.S. government has put into the into the supplier base and into the market. Uh, with a variety of different infrastructure and energy and defense related uh, spending. So I think it's, I think it's part, part of, of it is, is understanding and making sure both on the repair side and the production side, uh, what that demand looks like and uh, communicating that uh, often and effectively uh, to the, uh, to the suppliers or, or, and the, uh, and the shipbuilders so that they've got the ability to retain folks, train them if there is a lull. Uh, but but ultimately keep them happy and uh, and working in, in on the shipyards. So we are, we are running up on our uh, our one hour time here. Uh, if there are any more questions, feel free to raise a hand or throw it in the chat. Uh, I do see that uh, Tom Anderson was asking Jevin Louie if the uh, this draft naval deterrence act will be sent to the group. Uh, I've got to, I've got to move it beyond speak, um, uh, notes in an outline. Uh, I've been actually noodling on, you know, I've got like handwritten notes for already a year on this, but I think this, one of the virtues of this, uh, enablers group is, uh, it's, uh, forced me to begin to type. So, uh, what I will do is, uh, Lou and I are going to work on a, a piece and, um, we'll then be happy to circulate it with the group. Great, thanks, Jeb. Appreciate it. Um, so we are at our time, so I'll go ahead and, and close. But thank you very much, everybody, uh, for being here. Uh, it's a terrific discussion. Um, let's keep this conversation going because I think there's opportunities here, um, both in terms of improving U.S. shipbuilding and ship repair, and then leveraging and exploiting you know, what what can be done with allies. I mean, there's clearly capacity and, and not know how that they bring that could help the U.S. in its endeavor. Um, so thank you very much, and um, for uh, Henry and for David, uh, we appreciate you being here, and we'll let you know. Next, the next talk, uh, we're going to try and focus on um, uh, opportunities for AUKUS, talking about uh, options for power protection by Australia beyond submarines. So we're going to look at hypersonic weapons and uh, how they might be part of this as well.
So that'll be our next uh, talk. We'll let you know the dates.